Um, this is Steve. Steve plays the harpsichord, and I know he's so excited to not only play for you, but to tell you guys a little bit more about this incredible instrument that he brought um, with him today. So without further ado, I will hand it over. Guys in the back doing the, the AV stuff, let me know if you can hear a good deal and the camera, good position, okay. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Steve Hilton. Um, I, the program today, does everyone have a program if you want one? Uh, is called, if, if not Allison has some, the program today is called A Taste of Baroque Music. I am a harpsichordist. This is a, you bet, this is a harpsichord. It, it never, I, I never fool anyone, this is not a flute. Um, Today we're going to be talking about Baroque music. Uh, instrumentalists and vocalists in the audience, classically trained folks, raise your hand. Good. Piano, violin. We have a violinist. Piano person. Good. Pian uh, any string players? Uh, wind instruments? What kind? Someone else? Yes? Saxophone, great. Next time I come, we're going to play together. So these are all excellent instruments to play together. Flute is, of course, a Baroque instrument. Um, interestingly enough, the saxophone and all single reeds were not Baroque instruments, but they sound amazing with Baroque instruments playing together. And I would love to play with a French hornist, a uh, horn and F. That would be a lot of fun. So anyway, today we're going to talk about Baroque music, the Baroque era in Europe. Uh, it was primarily from the years 1550 to 1750. Um, back then, the piano was not invented yet. The piano was invented in approximately the year 1710 in Italy by a guy named Christo, uh, Cristofore. Um, however, during the Baroque era in Europe, there were three keyboard instruments, primarily three. This is one, the harpsichord. The second one is called a clavichord, which kind of looks like a cigar box. Um, and you can, you, it's pretty lightweight, it's very quiet, and you can just put it on a table and play it um, in a room. This, it wouldn't work in this room, this room is too big, um, but it can work in a small room. And the third keyboard instrument during the Baroque era, if you've ever been into a church in Europe or a church here, you've seen this keyboard instrument, it's an... It's an organ. That's right. Organs have been around hundreds of years before these things were ever made. Um, harpsichord was made probably the early ones in Italy, probably around the year 1500, 1520, 1530, something like that. Um, how does the harpsichord work compared to a piano? So piano action, if you've ever seen inside of that thing, you press the key and there's a very complex action in there, a bunch of pieces of wood that sort of move around, little levers and things. Um, and in the end on a piano, a hammer that's made out of wood wrapped with a very hard felt strikes the string, right? Or on, a, on that piano, it strikes a string up like this. Um, and the harder, the harder that you press the piano key, the louder the sound that you get. Harpsichord doesn't work that way. The way a harpsichord works is the key is kind of like a teeter-totter. So it, there's a pin in the middle of the key. I press down on the out, this, this side of the key, the front side of the key, the back side of the key goes up. And it lifts something called a jack. A jack is a flat piece of wood. Or today, we often make them out of a very special kind of plastic. That jack lifts. And at the top of the jack is a plucker. We call that plucker a plectrum. The plectrum plucks the string. And that sets the soundboard in motion, and then the sound carries out, and everybody gets to hear it. Uh, so, so a harpsichord action is very, very simple compared to um, a piano. Someone asked me earlier, um, oh, by the way, a special thank you to David and Ed for helping me move up here today. I wanted to say that before I started, and I forgot. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, someone asked me, I think Ed actually asked me about the Pluckers, the plectrum, do they have to be replaced a lot? Not, not really. Um, on historically accurate harpsichords that are in museums, um, the pluckers were made out of sort of whatever the, the, um, the builders could find, usually animal material. So if you take the end of a goose feather, 
not the feathery part, but the hard end, they could carve little pluckers. They're very small, maybe an eighth of an inch sort of long. They would use that. You could also use like a pig quill or something like that uh, from pig. That, that's what they would generally use. Today, we, we kind of frown on using animal products, um, but we use a small little pieces of plastic that simulate that. And, that's, and, they, and they last a pretty long time. This instrument was built in um, about the year 2002. So, and it, it's never had its plectrum place, replaced yet, or its strings. Um, another difference between the harpsichord and the piano, those of you on this side of the room can probably see, um, how many keys does a modern piano have? 88. 88. Modern pianos generally have 88 keys. My harpsichord has 52. Um, some harpsichords have 47. Some have 63. There was no standard in the Baroque era for any of this stuff, so the builders did whatever they wanted. I have about four octaves and a couple notes. Um, so if I run out of notes, and I will run out of notes on one of the pieces I play today, a little bit later Baroque piece, I will run out of notes, um, and so I sort of make it up. Uh, I won't tell you, but <laughs> I, have to, I just have to sort of fake it. Um, and that's very common in the Baroque era. We would fake a lot of that kind of stuff because you just didn't have the, you know, you don't have enough notes. Today, we're going to sample Baroque music, taste Baroque music from three countries. I want to get us in the mood for this. Imagine we're in Europe. It's the year 1550 or 1650. There's no electricity. There are no lights. There's no air conditioning. There's no, you know, central heat. There are no cars. There's no trucks. This is pre-industrial revolution. It's a much quieter place than our world is today. The loudest sound you might hear would be sort of horses clomping by on the street or maybe a carriage rolling by. Our instruments, our period instruments, are much more quiet. There's a much quieter instrument than that instrument, uh, a modern piano. So let's go to our first country, France. Uh, French Baroque music is lesser known outside of Baroque music circles than other types of and other Baroque music from other countries. Um, however, France has an extremely rich tradition um, of music, f published music from the medieval times in France all the way to modern times. Obviously, there's older music in France that's older than medieval. We just don't have anything written. So we, we don't really know what sort of music looked like back then. I'm going to focus on two aspects of French Baroque music. The first aspect is called ornamentation. Um, ornamentation is a musical term, um, but it's very, very similar to the term that we use in English, uh, ornament. And we use the word ornament a lot at Christmas time because it's the things that we put on Christmas trees. Um, question for you folks, why do we put ornaments on Christmas trees? Like, what does it do for the tree? Anyone have a thought? Sparkle, someone said embellish. Any other thoughts? Beautify. Beautify, it lights it up, all of the, it does all of those. That's what ornamentation does in music. I can play three notes. Those are nice. I can ornament those three notes. I can ornament them a different way. Ornamentation adds beauty and interest. French Baroque music has a very unique feeling to it. It's very sensitive and sort of delicate, almost in an introspective way. Although, honestly, I think French modern classical music is the same way. If you've ever listened to Debussy or Eric Satie, that's all in the French tradition. And it all started even before the Baroque era. French music is kind of like that. Um, I'm going to start with a composer named Francois Couperin. Couperin, in English. Um, he was a preeminent pre harpsichordist and composer in the early 1700s in France. He wrote a book called The Art of Playing the Harpsichord. It was published in the year 1716. And in this book, he describes for us, um, I think he does an amazing job of describing a very few words what's special about French music and French Baroque music. In this, I'm going to read you a quote, a short quote. In this quote, he talks about a piece of musical form called a prelude. 
A prelude is a type of, it's just a musical form. Um, however, I think the quote really applies to all French Baroque music. And, and this is his quote from The Art of Playing the Harpsichord. He writes, a prelude is a composition in which the fancy can free itself from all that it is written in a book. One may hazard to say that in many things, music has its prose and its verse. And I think ornamentation in French Baroque adds the poetry to the musical verse. I'm going to play for you um, a Couperin's sixth prelude from his art of playing the harpsichord. And, and, and listen to the ornamentation and see if you can sort of feel some of that introspective sensitivity in, in the French Baroque music. <laughs> Um, so Baroque music has movements to it. Uh, when you go to the symphony and you hear a Beethoven symphony or you hear a Brahms symphony or something like that or a concerto, it has movements, right? And movements are similar to chapters in a book, right? The movements separate, like in a book, chapters, sort of they develop the plot, they change sort of the feeling of the book, they develop characters and sort of what's happening in... Um, in the story. That, that's what mu movements do in a piece of music. Now, in French Baroque music, often the names of the movements are very early European dances. Um, what, what are some of the dances that we do today or that we've done, say, over the last 70, 80 years? What are some of the names of the dances? Waltz. Walt, someone said waltz, yes? Tango, oh, right. polka. polka. Someone said the shag. What? Shag. shag good. Gavotte. Gavotte. Do we still gavotte? <laughs> ah, that would be exciting. Hold that. Hold that thought. Hold the. Hold the gavotte thought. So. So. Uh, sometimes people say, "What's it? Uh, foxtrot, uh, merengue, salsa." All of those kinds of dances, with the exception of the waltz and the gavotte, were created um, between the years 1900 and 1950. So they're dances that are 100-ish uh, years old, is sort of like that. Waltz is a little older, it was created in the uh, 1800s. 
French dances and, and sort of these early European dances are words that we generally don't use anymore, and we generally don't dance them, although this gentleman knew uh, one of those words, which is a gavotte. That is one of these early European dances. So is bourré, allemande, sarabande, courant, minuet. These are all early European dances that most of which started like in the Renaissance, went through the Baroque, and then fell out of fashion. So they were around for a few hundred years. Back then, um, right, we had no TV, no YouTube, no CDs, right? So people entertain themselves with dancing and music a lot. So dances lasted a lot longer than, than maybe they do today. Um, I'm going to um, play a piece of French Baroque music for you, an allemande. An allemande is a, is a dance in four beats, like a foxtrot, kind of formal, like a foxtrot. Um, this is from uh, Jean-Henri Dangobert. Dangobert, this is from his suite in G major. He wrote it in 1689. You'll hear lots of ornamentation in this piece also. So here's what I'm going to do. At the beginning of the piece, I'm going to play it without the ornamentation. I'm just going to play the notes that are on the page that the composer wrote. And at some point in the middle of the piece, I'm going to switch and, and, and ornament it myself. Okay? And, and you'll get a sense. And I do this um, primarily because some people don't like a lot of ornamentation, like my mom. So I have to strip it all out for her. Um, but some people love the ornamentation, so I put it in. So it'll give you the sense of sort of what's going on with this French music. <laughs> liked the French piece without the ornamentation better? Anyone? Could you tell when I added it back in? Okay, yeah. 
French Baroque music has a lot of that. But if you look at French Baroque art and architecture, it's the same. Very ornate. Well, so is Italian, really, right? Really super ornate, lots of gold leaf stuff. Um, now I'm going to play you a really cute, short, um, dance-themed piece um, based on a dance called the jig. And a jig is, of course, still a word that we use in English today. Um, a jig, if you think about what a jig, it kind of sounds like a happy kind of stomping around dance. Um, a jig is in a, tri in a triple meter, right? So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, one, two, three, or sometimes in nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, that kind of thing. Um, and this is also, this piece, this jig, uh, it's French, so we call it a jig by Dangobert. Uh, this is from his suite in D major, also published in 1689. Often in French Baroque music, the music will have 9, 10, 12, 14 movements. And so they'll break it up with little short jigs like that. And often the jig is also at the end, because, I mean, they're so darn cute. I, you, you sort of listen to them and you sort of smile. Uh, so the composers were kind of smart that way. They, put, they didn't put the heavy, deep stuff at the end. They put the fun stuff at the end. OK, now let's leave France. We're going to go south in Europe into Italy. Uh, Italy is the home of so much classical music innovation. Um, and as you know, Ital Italian is the language we use for classical music jargon, right? So the movements of modern classical music like the, the andante and presto and allegro and vivace, all of these words are Italian. Piano is an Italian word, cello, viola. Even violin is violino, right? So, so it, it, Italian is the language that we use in music jargon because there's so much innovation in classical music that came out of Italy. I'm going to give us a little chronological taste of Italian Baroque music, starting in the early, early Baroque, um, the early side um, of the Italian Baroque, Baroque time. And, and I think Italian, early Italian Baroque music sounds a lot like Renaissance music. If you've ever been to the Renaissance, Fair. It has a very Renaissance-y feel to it, a little less polyphony, a little bit more sort of uh, just an older style. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, Girolamo Frescobaldi. Frescobaldi was born in 1583. So this is you know right at sort of the beginning of the Baroque era. He was a very early pioneer of instrumental music for Italian Baroque. Um, he was born in Ferrara. Ferrara is in, I don't know if anyone's been there, that's in northern Italy a little bit east of Milan. He was an incredible keyboardist. Later in his life, he was appointed the head organist at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So if you're, you know, the head organist in Vatican City, I mean, you're, you're pretty much at the top of the game, right? Because you have to be hired by the Pope, right? That, that's who's hiring him. So he was incredible. I'm going to play one of Frescobaldi's fugues. Has anyone, does that, has anyone heard of a fugue before? Right, okay. So a fugue is like a round. A round is like row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. So in a round, like row, row, row your boat, I can start singing it. And two measures later, you can start singing it. And two measures later, this gentleman can start singing it. We can all sing it together, and it all fits together nicely. A fugue is a little bit like that. Um, there's a theme in the fugue, 
And I'm going to play that theme. I'm going to start like the soprano line of the theme, and later I'm going to bring in an alto line, the same exact theme. Later I'm going to bring in the tenor line. Later I'm going to bring in the bass line, all at different times. I'm going to play all four parts with two hands, and I'm going to add in other stuff also to make it interesting. So a fugue is a lot more complex than a round, but because of that, I think it's more interesting. If we all sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat together, after about 30 seconds of singing it, it's pretty boring. So uh, I think fugues are a little better than that, and it's because of that complexity. I'm going to play for you um, Fresco Baldi Fugue. Um, we have two of them remaining from him. He wrote a lot more, but that's all we have left. This is a fugue in G minor. He probably wrote this in about the year 1608, 1610, so it's really early fugal development. Um, in Europe. Let's move forward a hundred years in Italy now to Domenico Scarlatti. Domenico Scarlatti was born in 1685, so that's about a hundred years after uh, Fresco Baldi. He was born in Napoli, in Naples, uh, so that's south of Rome. He spent his life, though, most of his sort of like young adult and adult life um, working for the Spanish and Portuguese royal families creating music for them, being their court musician, writing all kinds of great music, and teaching the royal family's children 
how to play music because that was expected um, of, of royalty's kids. Um, he is he's an amazing harpsichordist um, and keyboardist. He was responsible for writing 555 harpsichord sonatas. I mean, just a huge amount of musical production um, for the royal family and in general in his life. It's an interesting story. He um, was invited to a party at a nobleman's house in Rome during his life. And I'm sure at this party there was a lot of fine Italian wine being consumed. And at some point in the evening, the nobleman said to Scarlatti, we're going to have a contest. Who is the best keyboardist in the world? And of course, Scarlatti took up that challenge because he was sure it was, it was him. Um, another person at that party joined the competition. That person's name was George Friedrich Handel. Um, Handel wrote Messiah. Handel was an exceptional keyboardist. So they had this keyboard contest, and when it was over, the nobleman stood up, and the nobleman was pretty smart, and he probably realized that musicians are temperamental, composers are worse, and the nobleman said, Scarlatti is the finest keyboardist in the world. Handel is the finest organist in the world. So, so just like today, everyone got an award. Everyone got a prize. Um, a cute little story. I'm going to play for you one of these Scarlatti sonatas, one of the 555. This is a, a sonata in uh, E major. It's a, a K380. And I think it sounds kind of royal in sort of what he was sort of evoking with this piece. classical music scene often looks like it's dominated by male composers. That is a fallacy. There is a very long tradition of female composers, especially in Italy. Maddalena Casulana wrote and published the first book of music 
in the year 1566. Women had been writing music for a lot longer than that, but that was the first published book of music that we have in 1566. Um, in this music, it was often sponsored by a wealthy person. That's sort of how music was written and published. A Madalena Kazulana wrote a dedication page at the beginning of this piece of music. Um, and I'd like to read something from that page. She dedicated this book of music to someone named Isabella de' Medici. They were both Florentine, the Casulana and de' Medici were Florentine um, women. Um, the de' Medici family, of course, had been around for hundreds of years already. Very powerful, wealthy family um, in Florence. And, and Casulana wrote the following in this dedication uh, to, to Isabella de' Medici. I want to show the world as much as I can in this profession of music the vain error that men alone possess the gifts of intellect and artistry and that such gifts are never given to women. She wrote this 500 years ago in the dedication to her book of music. So I don't know if that means things have changed a lot in music or not enough, but either way, I think it's amazing that she wrote this to, you know, Isabella de' Medici in her book. There's a long, long tradition of female composers in all of classical music. On another program, I could come for you and play only female composers who wrote for this instrument. It's incredible. Um, I'm going to play for you the first movement of a three sonata piece by Anna Bonn. Anna Bonn de Venezia. She's Venetian. She's from Venice. She was born in 1736. She published a book of sonatas when she was 19 years old. Um, they're very modern in form. I mean, then shows she published them in the years 1757. It's right at the end of the Baroque era. Um, they almost feel kind of classical in nature, more like a uh, Haydn or Mozart in feel, um, but they are Baroque. They are written in three movements, like sonatas. Most modern sonatas are in the sort of post-Baroque era. Um, are, the first movement is fast, the second movement is slow, the third movement is fast. Anna Bonn did not do it that way. Her first movement is fast, her second movement is fast, her third movement is even faster. Um, <laughs> I only have time to play you the first movement today, um, but they're great pieces. This is Bond's Sonata for Keyboard, Opus 2, Number 6. I think she wrote 12 of these keyboard sonatas. Um, I hope you love it. It's great stuff.
Now we're going to go to Germany. Ignore everything I've done or said today, everything I've played, all the composers I've mentioned. Question for you. When you think of Baroque music, which big name composer comes to mind? Starts with a B. Yes, four letters. Starts with a B and it's Bach. Exactly. Now, a little, uh, another little tidbit for today. Today is Bach's 338th birthday. I know. Should we sing happy birthday to him? <laughs> to Johan? Uh, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, yeah, this is his 338th birthday today. Um, so this is a very propitious day. It seems appropriate to be playing a, uh, a Baroque music today. I'd like to make the, 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 the suggestion that Germany sort of lagged in the development of its own Baroque style. And I say that, and I think it was caused by, in the early part of the Baroque era, from 1618 to 1648, there was something going on in Germany and that part of Central Europe. Does anyone know what it was? The Thirty Years' War. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Thirty Years' War. It's, and, and in parts of Germany, population declined by 50% for over a 30-year period. And you really can't finance a war with the money and the people and all of that and still support the arts and expect the arts to flourish. Um, and I, I, I think that caused Germany to, to sort of not develop its own style as early. That's, that said, there, there were lots of German Baroque composers back then. Um, but what I really think was happening, especially in the later Baroque period after the war, is that French and Italian Baroque music had a huge influence on German composers. I'd like to start and, and, and highlight that with the composer um, George Philip Telemann. Telemann was born in uh, 1681, so sort of that, that second half of the Baroque era. Um, he was a hugely popular musician and composer. He was an organ master, a choir director. He worked at the finest and largest churches in Germany. He, in his day, he was a contemporary of Bach. They were around at the same time. They knew each other. Telemann was much preferred in Germany than Bach ever was. Um, Telemann was also better liked as a person. Bach was a little difficult to get along with, um, a little temperamental. And Telemann's music was, was definitely preferred over Bach's music. Um, Telemann wrote 36 fantasias, or fantasies. Fantasias, fantasies are multi-movement pieces, but they're kind of short, uh, rather cute. He wrote 36 of them. The first 12 in the Italian form, the second 12 in the French form, the third 12 in the Italian form, 36 in all. I'm going to play for you one of those fantasias. It's three movements, but it's pretty short, although you play it as four movements. Interestingly enough, it starts slow movement, fast movement. You go back to the slow movement, and then you end very short, fast movement. Um, and uh, I'm, have you been noticing when I start playing a piece, I sort of mess around with stuff up here? Um, that's because the harpsichord can make different sounds. Um, I can invoke different sounds on the harpsichord, much like an organ. This is related to the organ. On an organ, if I want it to sound like a, a horn or a flute or strings, I pull out stops, little levers on the side or press in buttons. Harpsichord has some of that. I've got little knobs up here I can adjust. You can't see them. They're inside here. Afterwards, come up and look. Um, I'm going to use one of these knobs right now for the beginning um, of this piece. You'll notice it. It's called the buff stop or the lute stop. It, it pushes a small piece of leather up against every string. You'll notice a difference when I play with the lute stop than when I don't. After I play this piece, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, and the question, I'll tell you what it is ahead of time. Uh, it's a little quiz. Is this fantasia written in the Italian form or is it written in the French form? That'll be the question. Okay, here we go. Telemann fantasia uh, in uh, E minor.
Okay, now the quiz. So who thinks that was written in the French style? Put your hand up. Who thinks it was written in the Italian style? Put your hand up. Okay, a lot of people not sure, not willing to commit. So, so there's a clue. If you look in the program at the names of the movements, they are in French. This is written in the French style, although it's kind of a trick question. Telemann is German. He's writing in the French style. It's not exactly French, but he, he considered this the French style. So this is one of the 12 uh, 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 fantasies he wrote in that sort of middle section. So Johann Sebastian Bach, most well-known Baroque composer today, completely legendary, um, highly, highly influenced by French and Italian Baroque music. We, we could do one program or a hundred programs on Bach, easily, easily. Um, I'm going to play two pieces of Bach for you today. The first one um, is a short selection from the Goldberg Variations. Now, the Goldberg Variations of Bach were written as an aria and a 30 variations. So the aria is like the theme, is the main sort of piece. It's a short piece. Um, and then each variation of the 30 variations takes the aria and modifies it a little bit, right? So it's, it's sort of an aria and 30 variations. It's an extremely long piece of music, uh, an incredible piece of music. Um, this piece of music, the Goldberg Variations, was written for uh, a Count Hermann Karl von Kaiserling. Uh, Count Kaiserling was a Russian ambassador to the Saxony region of Germany. And he had insomnia. And he once came to Leipzig to meet Bach, and he asked and commissioned Bach to write a piece of music to help him sleep at night. Bach wrote the music for him, delivered it to the Count, the Count gave it to his chief head musician, whose name was Johann Gottlieb Goldberg. Johann Gottlieb Goldberg was the first person to play this music besides Bach, and so we call this piece of music the Goldberg Variations. It's a great story. We don't know if it's actually a true story, but it was written, that, that story was written by Bach's first biographer, who wrote Bach's biography shortly after Bach died. So we think it's true, we just don't know for sure. In order for it to be true, when this piece, when the Goldberg Variations were written, given to Kaiserling, and Kaiserling gave it to his, his, his chief musician to play, Johann Gottlieb Goldberg would have had to have been 14 years old. It's possible that he was in the employment of the Count at that age, but we're not sure. Either way, it's a really great story. So let's go with it um, as a great story. I'm um, going to play the aria, right, that theme piece for you. Um, it's written in the French style. If you remember what we said about Couperin, when he, Couperin wrote that book, The Art of Playing the Harpsichord, uh, and that I read you a quote. And I really think in this aria, this is Bach freeing himself from all that is written in the book. This is Bach sort of opening up the heavens and writing um, music. And I, I, think, I think you'll be able to feel that um, in this aria. This is the aria from Bach's Goldberg Variations.
Bach loved Italian Baroque music, and especially the music of Antonio Vivaldi. Uh, Vivaldi, I guess his claim to fame is uh, the Four Seasons, uh, that huge string piece. So Vivaldi loved the violin, and the violin was rising in his time, so he wrote a lot of um, violin music and, and stringed music. So Vivaldi created the modern concerto form. So, so a concerto, when you go to the symphony, you have a solo instrument who stands up front and is a violin or a piano or a flute or whatever, and there's an orchestra behind them, and then the soloist is playing this incredible music, and then the, the orchestra accompanies them. So, so in, in Baroque music, we don't call the orchestra an orchestra um, in this concerto form. We call it the, the ripieno section. And, and the Italian word ripieno um, means a stuffing or filling, stuffing or filling. So it's kind of the orchestra sort of fills in, sort of stuffs up the music a little bit. Um, and, and Vivaldi is responsible for creating this modern concerto form, this concept of a soloist playing with sort of an orchestra behind them. That's a Vivaldi thing. Bach loved this. Bach was a contemporary of uh, Vivaldi. They were, they were writing at the same time. They knew each other. Bach loved these concertos so much that he took Vivaldi's violin concertos and rewrote them so that a harpsichordist could play them as solos by himself. Didn't need to have an orchestra. So literally Bach just literally rewrote pieces of Vivaldi and published them as his own. So it turns out, so this was done in the year 1713 to 1714. As a note, there were no copyright laws um, in Germany at the time. The copyright laws, uh, earliest copyright laws were in the United Kingdom in the year 1710. They didn't make it, copyright law didn't make it to France until 1766, and, uh, and uh, it didn't make it until Germany until even later. Until even later. So this was allowed back then. Uh, today, of course, you would get sued if you did what Bach did for Vivaldi. Uh, but it, it's, I'm glad he did it, because we've got these pieces. I've got these pieces to play on the harpsichord. I'm going to play for you my final piece today, and that is one of these concertis. I'm going to play you the first movement of the Bach harpsichord concerto in F major, which is really the Vivaldi violin concerto in G major. Same piece of music. And it kind of sounds like a violin piece, uh, which, of course, is the genius of Bach. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 